job. Wasn't that wonderful? What a question. What if? Nehemiah, turn to the book of Nehemiah with me, please. Chapter number eight. We are in a series entitled Get Plugged In. Get Plugged In. I uh, have been uh, seeking God's face for an opportunity to preach this series for several months. And I really feel like at this point in our church, where we are as a church, that this is about as uh, relevant as it's ever been. We've got new folks coming in, folks visiting from all over the country, and we're so grateful that you're here. And we're seeing growth. We're seeing new folks added to the church. We'll see several added to the church today, and we're grateful for that. And these are not people, by the way, that are just uh, flippantly uh, walking in the door saying, this is where I want to be. Some of these folks have been visiting for months and praying. But at this time in our church, I really feel like that we're poised and positioned for God to do unbelievable things, provided we could get the membership of our church plugged in. And I'm asking God to help each and every one of you understand what it means to be plugged in. This morning, we're going to look at the second message in the series. Last week, we looked at getting plugged into the membership. It took me two services to get that message out. But tonight, Brother Estep's preaching, and I can't wait to hear him. So I'm going to preach both these messages this morning, all right? <clears throat> what are you going to do, get up and leave? No, you ain't. You're going to sit there till I get done. Come on. Yeah. There's, we're, going, we're going to look this morning at getting plugged into the meeting. All right, getting plugged into the meeting. Now, let me say this. You say, preacher, I'm here. I know you're here. But there's a difference in just being here and being plugged yeah. in. Yeah. Come on now. And we're going to look at it this morning in the scripture. And I could have used a variety of passages from the New Testament, but God led me over to Nehemiah chapter number 8. I'm stalling because some of y'all don't know where Nehemiah is. If you've, are you there yet? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Nehemiah. Stand with me, please. Nehemiah chapter number 8. Let's begin reading in verse 1. All the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation both of men and women and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and the women and all that could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive under the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood a whole bunch of men Verse 5, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Some of you wonder why we always stand up for the reading of the Bible verse. I don't know. It might come from this passage right here. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands, and they bowed their faces and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. There's a lot more we could read, but I'm just going to stop right there. I want to preach for a little bit on getting plugged into the meeting. Amen. Getting plugged into the meeting. Lord, help us this morning. I'm grateful for what I feel in my soul right now. Lord, the, the moving of God started when the first song was sung, and then the choir, and then the specials. And Lord, I'm just, my heart right now is just filled to overflowing. I'm grateful for your presence. Give us liberty to expound the scriptures this morning. May God's people benefit, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. One of the key functions of the church, the church has many functions and many, many facets, but one of the key, one of the main facets of the church is the church services where God's people come and are fed by the word of God. In fact, one of the main priorities, and I preached this just a few weeks ago, 
one of the main priorities and duties of the pastor is the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God, or as the Bible says, feeding the flock of God. Spencer, if you would turn these monitors down here just a little bit on the platform for me. Thank you. And I want to say that the feeding of the flock, the, 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 the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God takes place during the services that we have in our church. Some churches have more services than others. Uh, seems like during the COVID, a lot of churches have streamlined and they are stopped having their Sunday night services. A lot of them stopped having midweek services. Um, and then, of course, if you go to the book of Acts, they had church every day. And so uh, here at our church, we have a 10 o'clock on Sunday morning, Sunday school hour. I'm grateful for our classes and our teachers and the individual teaching that we have on Sunday morning at 10. And then we come back in here at 11 for our main worship service. And then we meet again on Sunday night at 5 o'clock. And if you don't come to Sunday night services at 5, you don't have any idea what you're missing. Uh, it's the cherry on top as far as I'm concerned. And then on Wednesday night, uh, we have church where so we can come in here halfway through the week and top off our tank, amen, and kind of get us through uh, the rest of the week. And I'm grateful for the services that we have here. But for a child of God that is a member of Calvary Baptist Church to get plugged in, they need to understand the importance of getting plugged into the meetings. And as I said, I could look at other passages in the New Testament. I could look at a number of them. But God led me over here to Nehemiah chapter number eight. It's an Old Testament passage. And if I can... Uh, try to take the verses here and make an application to the New Testament church. Even though this wasn't a New Testament church, there are some things here that I believe we could learn and glean from that would help us understand what it means to get plugged into the meeting. Number one, if you're taking notes, obviously we have to start with getting plugged in by our attendance to uh, the meetings. Now, we notice here in Nehemiah chapter number eight, several times he emphasized the importance of the attendance. We see in verse number one, all the people gathered themselves together as one man. Here at Calvary Baptist Church, I'm very, uh, very uh, particular and very strong on the importance of unity within the local church. And, and there's, there's not a time when a church is more unified than we're all together in one place. Preached just the other night on numbers or strength in numbers out of Ecclesiastes chapter number four, two's better than one. Amen. I, and, and I'm, I'm taking that verse and, and I'm running with it. Uh, but if you're up preaching to a group of people, trust me, two's better than one. Amen. And uh, when I, during this uh, few weeks of the shutdown, when we only had 10 people in here, you're talking about hard preaching to 10 people in a church that'll seat 600 people. And it was tough. And I was so grateful for the day when everybody came in and was here together. And I'm longing for the day that the whole church can be here together. We still got a few people uh, that are holding back. But I'm, I'm telling you right now, a church being together as one is no more obvious than when they're in the house of God for a regularly scheduled church service. We see all the people in verse 1 gathered themselves together as one. One man, verse two, congregation both of men and women and all that could hear with understanding. So everybody was there. And actually, if you'll notice in this chapter, I didn't read the whole chapter for the sake of time, but in chapter number eight, you will find the, the phrase and all the people is mentioned 11 times in just 18 verses. And so there was a lot going on here and everybody was there. They were in attendance. And I quoted a verse uh, a lot, Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 25. New Testament says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. And I believe that it is impossible to get plugged into your local church if you're not in the services and you're not plugged in to the attendance of the services. And I challenge you to get plugged in to the Sunday school, get plugged into the Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night service. I remember years ago, Dr. Lee Robertson, he kind of came up with this little saying, a lot of preachers down through the years have hijacked it and have used it. And I think it was, um, he talked about uh, three to survive. How did he say that? Three to thrive, three to thrive. And he said, if you can be in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, that God will help you grow, take your level to another level with God. And so the emphasis obviously in our text begins with getting plugged 
into the attendance. That includes revivals and missions conferences. We do our best to try to give you as much of a heads up as we can. We have a church calendar that we pass out the first service of each year that's got the, the meetings and the missions conference and the summer revivals, and they're on there so that you can try and schedule your events, your traveling, your uh, family reunions, your birthday parties, your, your uh, vacations. Try and schedule those where there's not a conflict because when we have those missions conferences, I mean, look what God did in our church during the missions conference. What now? I mean, we're still, uh, I'm still in a bit of a, a state of shock over what God did in our church, and that wouldn't have happened. But we had phenomenal attendance during those meetings, and Brother Suttle, God preached, the, he preached a message God laid on his heart, and he was able to put that burden on the heart of our church, and as a result of that missions conference, we saw our faith promise just explode. We're now about $83,000 above all last year's missions pledges, and God laid that Every Nation Project on my heart. That was a result of the missions conference. And what I'm saying is if we hadn't have been here, that wouldn't have happened. We've got a revival coming up in uh, July with Brother Buster Mullins. And many of you have never heard Brother Buster Mullins. I'm going to go on ahead and tell you, he's an old-timey. I'm talking about an old-timey mountain preacher from Chilhowee, Virginia. And if you miss that man's preaching, you are going to miss some God-anointed preaching like you have never heard in your life. I can't wait till he gets here. I mean, from the minute he walks into the pulpit and calls out his text, you can feel the presence of God settle in on a place and God will work in your heart and move in your heart through the preaching of the word of God. All I'm saying is you gotta be here. Amen. The East Step family's here. Our missionaries in Leon, Mexico, they hadn't been here in five years and there's been a lot changed in five years. Brother East Step, and we're so glad to have you and your family here with us uh, for a couple of weeks, but I'm just gonna ask you, is it better being here in person than it is watching the services on the live stream? He said, yes, sir, and, yes, sir, yes, sir. That's what he said. That was his answer. We don't even need a translator for that. Is it better in person than it is on the live stream? <laughs> yes, sir, it is better. It's a whole lot better, amen. And all I'm saying is getting plugged in to the attendance because you don't know what you're gonna miss. Somebody could get saved and you'd miss it. Somebody could get right with God that you've been praying for and you'd miss it. God could call somebody to preach. Somebody could surrender to the mission field. Uh, somebody could join the church. God could reveal a life-changing truth and you'd miss it. A missionary could come and present their work and you'd miss it. Uh, we could vote to take on a missionary or start a building project or introduce a new staff member and you'd miss it. All I'm saying is you get plugged in by being here. That's where it starts. I'm not going to turn to John chapter number 20, but in John chapter number 20, verse 19 down through verse number 25, we had one of the disciples named Thomas that decided he didn't want to go to church. Sunday night service, decided he didn't want to go. He was in a bad mood because Jesus had been crucified and he was probably having some doubts about whether or not all this stuff he had been hearing was even true. Didn't go. The Bible's clear to tell us he didn't go. He wasn't there. By not being in that service in John 20, verse 19 through verse number 25, he missed the Lord's presence. The Bible says in verse number 20 that when the disciples saw the Lord, they were glad he missed the Lord's presence because he wasn't there. The one thing he needed, the one thing he needed more than anything else, he missed it because he wasn't there. And that was seeing the Lord. He missed his presence. He missed the Lord's peace. In verse 21, the Bible says they were sore afraid. They were gathered there, but he came and spoke peace to them. He missed the Lord's presence. He missed the Lord's peace. He missed the Lord's purpose. In verse 21, Jesus says, as my father hath sent me, even so send I you. Thomas was not there to hear the great commission personally from the very lips of Jesus Christ. And he missed the Lord's power. In verse 22, the Bible says Jesus breathed on them and said, receive you the Holy Ghost. He missed all of that by staying at home to watch the Super Bowl. Yeah. Come on. Come on must have been something important to keep him out of church. All I'm saying is get plugged in. You get plugged in, start of all, first of all, by attending the service. I know I'm preaching to the choir this morning. You're here but we're gonna take this thing up a notch. We're now fixing to drill down on what it really means to be plugged into the service. Not only do we see in our text 
They were plugged into the meeting by attending, but secondly, they were plugged in by their attentiveness. And we can get plugged in, should be plugged in by our attentiveness. Look at what it says in verse number three, and he read therein from the street, uh, before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday. Some of y'all think I preach long. He read from the morning until midday. Before the men and the women and those that could understand, watch this, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. It's one thing to be in attendance. It's another thing to be attentive. Christians today are plagued with a short attention span. A lot of Christians have got the attention span of a baby puppy. And what's happened is pastors and worship leaders are racking their brain trying to come up with a new way to keep people's attention for longer than five seconds. Let's just be honest. If people were sitting on the edge of their seat and they were glued in, they were attentive to what God had to say, they could cut most of this garbage out that's going on in these so-called churches, but it's turned into a show to try to keep people's attention because they're not attentive to the voice of God. All they did in this passage of Scripture was read from the Bible. Imagine going to church and all they did was just read from the Bible and you went home. No songs, no choir, no specials. No fog machines, no strobe lights, no dance teams, no, no graphics, no screens, no monitors, no announcements, nothing. Just read the Bible. And the Bible says they were attentive. They were listening. I'm challenging you this morning. Get plugged into the service by being attentive. I want to say this. It demonstrates a seriousness when you're attentive in the house of God. Demonstrates the seriousness. I believe the word of God is worthy of our undivided attention, don't you? In Psalm 138, verse two, the Bible says that he's magnified his word above his name. When the word of God's being preached or when the word of God is being taught, I believe it has merited our undivided attention. It's amazing how many people can sit in church and be in the building, be in the service physically and their mind be someplace else. And they miss what God has for them. It demonstrates the seriousness. I don't know about you, but I believe church is serious. And I'm old school, okay? I I know I'm not old. That's not a joke. (laughs) At least I didn't intend for it to be. But I'm old school. When we was brought up, you went to church, you were serious. I didn't say dead. I'm preaching the opposite of that, actually. But church was serious. It was different. There was something about church. It was different from any other thing. There was a different attitude. There was a different mentality. We dressed different. We acted different. When I was little, we didn't run up and down the uh, the aisles of the church and run into people. We didn't get up and play on the platform. We didn't get up and bang on the pianos. We didn't chew bubble gum and stick it in the songbooks. Come on now. Stay with me. When we was in church, it was, it, was, it was a reverential seriousness. Things of eternal value, eternal things are happening and it demonstrates the seriousness. We've gotten, so, we've gotten such a casual attitude about church that, that I feel like we're losing that reverential attentiveness to what God's got to say. It demonstrates seriousness. It demonstrates sensitivity. When we come to church, I can't speak for everybody else's church, but when we come to this church, God talks. God speaks. And Matthew chapter 4 says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And I don't know about you, but if I'm going to be held accountable for every word God says, I want to hear every word God says. I want to be attentive. God starts speaking during the song service. Pick up a song book. We still use song books around here, as you notice. We still use song books. We sing, we look at the words, and those songwriters walked with God and had a touch of God on them, and they would sing. They would write songs that minister to hearts. Boy, when the choir was singing this morning, the value of one, boy, my heart was stirred when I thought about the words in those songs and the hymns that we sang. All I'm saying is God speaks, God works, God moves. It demonstrates the seriousness when we're attentive. It's easy to sing a song and not even think about the words in the song. 
It's easy sometimes. I, I, I watch videos sometimes of, of our special singing. Brother Kane will video a song and put it up and people are up singing. And you see people's heads between him and the piano. And they're looking down, looking around, they're not paying attention. I'm thinking to myself, how can you get anything out of the song? You're not even paying attention. Listen. Let the words minister. Let the preaching and the teaching minister. Put your phone, put your phone away. And get, get, get plugged into the service by being attentive. It demonstrates the seriousness. It demonstrates sensitivity. It demonstrates surrender. There's nothing else more important right now than God and God working and God moving. Nothing else is more important. Hey Amen. Just forget, forget about where you're going to eat lunch and what you're going to eat for lunch. Don't even think about it. People come to church sometimes and they come with the attitude to, to get out. I think Sunday mornings a lot of times turns into a drag race service. They drag in at 11 and race out at 12. I come to get in. I come to get in. Nothing else today matters. Nothing else today matters to me but what God's got for us in this service. And I believe with all my heart if everybody came to church and they had that attentiveness, I believe God would speak and God would listen. God would move. Pay attention to the announcements. I know you're used to cutting off the commercials. But people come to me after the service and say, so what time is this thing? And I said, I just told you. And I've got me a t-shirt. Brother Barley bought me a t-shirt. It says, it was in the bulletin. And I'm going to start wearing it to church. And people ask me, so what are the dates for that marriage getaway? I'm going to go, it was in the bulletin. <laughs> Pay attention. Pay attention to the missionaries when they come through here. Pay attention to what God's doing. Pay attention to the songs and the specials. And definitely, without doubt, pay attention to the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. Number three, write this down. We get plugged in by our anticipation. Get plugged in by our anticipation. If you're not careful, it'll take you the first 20, 30 minutes you're at church to get plugged in because you were so harem scarum coming in the door. Now just don't get mad at me. I can understand that happening about once every six months. But if that is your normal MO, coming in the door late, trying to find a chair and the service has already started and trying to get kids. To, and, and, and you haven't really, what you're demonstrating is I really didn't plan on being here this morning. It was kind of a last minute thing. Amen. Set your alarm. Yes, sir. I know this is deep, stay with me. But our church is the same distance from your house as it's always been. It hadn't moved, it ain't further. <laughs> you know how long it takes to get here. Stay with me now. I know this is deep for some of y'all. But if it takes 15 minutes to get to church and you leave at 10 till church time, you're going to be five minutes late. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that. And I did that without a calculator. You get plugged in by anticipating, I'm going to meet with God this morning. God's going to meet with me. He's going to meet with my family. I'm going to get there early. I'm going to get a seat. I'm going to pray a little while. And I'm going to get my heart and mind ready for what God has. This wasn't some impromptu meeting. The Bible says in verse 4, they built a pulpit just for the purpose of him to stand up and preach. This was planned. Had all these men... In verse number four, by the way, I preached a whole message one time on these men right here who's standing with the preacher. My goodness, what a message. These guys were standing around him for moral support. They were standing up there to add weight and gravity to the situation. They were standing up there in case he needed some help. They were standing up there as a testimony to the people that what's about to take place is serious. There's an air of anticipation. David said it like this, Psalm 100 verse 4, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. They were singing that song, what if? And I thought, what if? People were shouting before the service even started. What if they were coming in the door saying, 
Whoa, I'm so glad to be saved. I can't wait to hear what God has. Could you imagine the electricity in the air if we entered into his gates with thanksgiving instead of coming in with this, oh my goodness. I can't believe I can hardly find anywhere to park. I never have a problem finding a parking spot because I get here on Sunday morning about 7.30, amen. There's plenty of parking spaces at 7.30 on Sunday morning. If that's what's killing you and robbing you of your joy, maybe you ought to get down here a couple hours for church. Amen. Anticipation. They were looking forward to it. They were excited about it. The Bible said in verse five, they watched Ezra open the book, and when he opened the book, they all the people stood up. They were ready, man. I mean, they were fired up about hearing the word of God. Imagine, imagine that level of anticipation. David, Psalm 122, verse one said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. He didn't say, oh man, it's church time again. David, it's time to go to church again? I just went two weeks ago. What are they doing down there? Having all these services. Don't he know we got stuff to do? They said, David, it's church time. He went, woohoo, I get to go to church. Drop everything, everybody, just put a pin in whatever you're doing. We're going to meet with God at God's house. It's pretty awesome. Number four, is everybody still with me? Which brings me to my fourth point. Get plugged in by our affirmation. You know, it's fun preaching to people that get it. And it's not fun preaching to people that don't get it. And you say, preacher, why do you always say, are you still with me? Why do you always say, is everybody listening? Because I just want to make sure that I ain't going off and leaving you. Is everybody still with me? Notice verse 6. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, amen. Amen. With lifting up their hands. My goodness. I, if, if I was preaching to a crowd like that, I believe they'd, I'd preach myself to death. Imagine if you was preaching to a group of people and every time you blessed the Lord, they all said, Amen! Amen! I, I'd preach my guts out. Which I mean, I'd preach my guts out anyway. I walked out of here last Sunday and a woman said, I need to find out what kind of espresso machine you have at your house. I ain't running on express, so I can tell you that. It's a blessing preaching to people that come to hear preaching. What am I saying? I'm saying that you get plugged into the service by acknowledging and affirming vocally and with your body language that you are enjoying and that you appreciate what you're hearing from the word of God. All the people lifted up their hands and said, amen, amen. I got to just look into that a little bit. Did you know all four gospels ends with the word amen? Did you know that every book in the New Testament except for James and 3 John ends with amen? Or amen if you're from Maine. <laughs> it's biblical for New Testament Christians to say amen. You get know, the book of Revelation, Jesus said amen. In fact, Jesus is called the amen. Well, what does amen mean? It means let it be so. It means it's true. That's what it means. You are affirming the preaching and the teaching of the word of God when you say amen. You're getting plugged in by saying, I agree. That's exactly what it says. That's what it means. You say, well, I, I say amen. I say amen if I like it. I knew you were going to say that. Look back at chapter 5. I've got to show you something. Look back at chapter 5. You've got to see this. You need to say amen, not because you like it, but because it's true. You ought to say amen because God said it. Look at chapter 5. You've got to see this. Verse 13. Also I shook my lap and said, So God shake out every man from his house and from his labor that performeth not this promise, even thus shall he be shaken out and emptied. And all the congregation said amen and praise the Lord. That really wasn't an amen statement. Come on now. First mentioned principle 
of the word amen in your King James Bible. You ready for this? He wasn't preaching on the rapture. He wasn't preaching on the King James. He wasn't preaching on grace and mercy. First mentioned principle of the word amen. I don't know if y'all can handle this or not. He's, it's where a priest is cursing an immoral woman for committing adultery. Now watch this. I'm going to read it to you. Numbers chapter number 5, verse 21 and 22. And this water that causeth the curse shall go into thy bowels to make thy belly to swell and thy thigh to rot, and the woman shall say amen, amen. Come on now. Is everybody still with me? I don't know about that, preacher. I knew you was going to say that. I knew you were going to say that. You don't have to turn to Deuteronomy chapter number 27, but I'm turning to Deuteronomy 27 because some of y'all are looking at me like I just grew another nose. I only say amen when I like it. No, you say amen when it's true. Right. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter number 27, starting in verse number 15, all the way down to the end of the chapter is nothing but curses. Cursed be the man that maketh a graven or molten image, and all the people shall answer and say amen. And he goes from verse 15 down through verse number 26 with a whole bunch of curses and a whole bunch of stuff that you shouldn't do. And every single verse says, all the people shall say amen. You don't say amen because you like it. You say amen because it's true. Right. Amen. You say, well, preacher, I think you're making a big deal out of it. I'm, I'm, just, not, I'm just not a vocal person. I think what your neighbor said last night when you was in a fight with your husband, I think what they said. I thought, I wonder what would happen if the neighbors had to call the police on Calvary Baptist Church for disturbing the peace. And the cops showed up and we're all smiling and shaking hands like, what's going on over here? Nothing. Preacher's preaching and we agreed with exactly what he said and God said it and we were going amen. And the roofs, and the, roofs the rafters are raising and people up and down the streets can hear us. You say, well, I just don't think it's that important for me to say amen. I don't think it's that important for me to affirm what's happening in the service. Well, I think it's interesting that in 1 Corinthians chapter number 14, Paul the apostle was talking to the church at Corinth, and listen to what he said in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 23, 24, and 25. He says, if therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that you're mad? And the answer is, yes, they will. Verse number 24, but if all prophesy, that word prophesy means preaching, spanning the scripture. That's the New Testament application for prophesy. Not foretelling, but forthtelling. If all prophesy and there come in one that believeth not or one unlearned, he is convinced of all. Now, how is an unbeliever coming into our church going to be convinced of all? How is everybody in this church going to prophesy all at the same time? It's very easy. When somebody's preaching, everybody else is saying amen. Yeah, amen. And everybody's preaching at the same time, and that unbeliever who's sitting there and hears that preacher preach and goes, I don't know about that. When he hears about 50 or 60 people say, that's exactly what God said. All of a sudden they go, well, I guess that's what God said. Everybody's saying the same thing. Amen. Look at what it says in verse 25. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. How? Everybody in the church convinces the unbeliever during the preaching by saying amen. But here's what normally happens. Preacher's preaching, and God gives him a very specific message. And as we say in Georgia, he starts plowing real close to your taters. He starts hoeing just a little bit too close to your taters. And you lock up and go, mm, oh no, here we go. My favorite sin my favorite sin that I love to commit all the time. There he is preaching on it again. Now, he don't know. Oh, well, I didn't until you locked up, and then I figured it out. They say if you throw a rock up in a pack of dogs, the one that goes to barking, that's probably the one that got hit. And I'm preaching, and I'm just preaching, and I look at you, and you're going, and I'm going, uh, they're probably guilty of what I'm preaching on right now. Everybody else around you sees it too. Some of y'all should not take up poker. You would lose your shirt. 
But when the preacher's preaching, and he's preaching the truth, and you say, amen, that's right. Preach it, brother. Bless him, Lord. Help him, Lord, whatever. You know what you're saying to the whole church? I'm plugged into the preacher. And somebody's sitting there that's on the fence. They don't really know if it's true or not. When they see everybody is saying amen, that's exactly what the truth. All of a sudden, now they're convinced. And they leave saying, you know what? There must be something to that. But if the preacher's preaching the truth and everybody's sitting there staring at him like a calf looking at a new gate, they're like, man, I didn't think he was preaching the truth and I don't think anybody else did either. Some of y'all probably wonder, why do I have these guys up here on on the platform? I pay them to say amen. (laughs) Some of y'all hung me out to dry a time or two. I learned. I'm going to have me an amen corner. Amen. Amen. Moral support. Amen. Get up here and back me up. Hey, you watch me when somebody else is preaching. I say amen. I sit on the edge of my seat. I'm listening. I'm attentive. I'm already looking forward to hearing Brother I don't even know if he's going to preach in English. He may preach in Spanish. I'm going to still say amen. Yeah. What are you preaching in tonight? English? <laughs> amen. <laughs> I don't know what he's saying, but I like it. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Let me close by saying this. One of the biggest dangers, you know as well as I do, one of the biggest dangers of a Christian is to be a forgetful hearer. And if your attention's not where it ought to be, and your anticipation's not where it ought to be, your affirmation's not where it ought to be, it's easy to walk out the door and within just a few minutes forget what God showed you. And what I'm preaching about this morning, about getting plugged in, this is how you remember messages for the rest of your life. Get plugged in to the service, to the meeting, and let God do something absolutely amazing in your life. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I wonder if there would be maybe somebody, God just spoke to your heart during the service. It could have been during the song service, and you've just been waiting for the service to be over so you could get in the altar and talk to God. The altar's open. Why don't you come right now? There may be somebody here this morning. Say, Pastor Shifflin, I'm not even sure I'm saved. I don't even know if I died right now where I would spend eternity. I, I hope I'd go to heaven, but I don't know that for sure. And I'd like for you to pray for me. Would there be somebody here this morning just by quietly slipping your hand up, say, preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure where I'm going when I die. Would you slip your hand up so that I can see that? I see that hand. I see that hand. God bless you. Anybody else, preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I died right now, I'd go to heaven. Can I tell you something? Jesus died on the cross to save your soul from a devil's hell. He wants to give you the gift of eternal life. He wants to transform your life. He wants to change your eternal destiny this morning if you'll let him. Turn to him in faith, believing. Repent of your sins. Call out to him as the only way to heaven, believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those of you that are watching the services on the live stream, there's a phone number on your screen right now. You can text that number. Say, I need to talk to somebody. If God is dealing with your heart, if you're not sure you're saved, if you will text that number, somebody will call you as soon as the service is over and take a Bible, and we'll do our best to show you from the Scriptures how you can know for sure you're going to heaven when you die. We've got several being baptized this morning. We've got a couple joining the church. You've got time right now to respond to the voice of God. God may be speaking to your heart about getting plugged in.